All right, hi everyone. How's everyone doing? Excited to be here in Orlando? I certainly am. Um, yeah, so design systems are, they aren't a new thing, uh, but I think it's safe to say that they're really popular right now. We have seen a really big increase in the amount of conversation around design systems in the past few years. More and more organizations are adopting them and writing about them. Here's some kind of more prominent examples, material designs, sketch kit. <clears throat> and, you know, why have design systems grown so popular in the past couple of years? For one, we have increasingly complex design problems to solve for. You know, we need to innovate faster. We need to keep up with the demands of our customers and put our products onto more devices and platforms. We're working with more distributed teams. I manage a team of completely remote designers that are all over the country and figuring out a common language and how we can all work together. Uh, a design system helps with that. Um, and importantly, we're also seeing the value um, of scaling design across our organizations and taking design thinking and best practices and really scaling it across all of our products. So design systems help us scale design. And I think uh, an important part of design systems is that we can allow the system to take on the repetitive common problems so that people can focus on solving more important or challenging or new problems. So several organizations have written about their successes with design systems. In his article, Design Doesn't Scale, um, Stanley Wood, who was a design director of, uh, at Spotify, said that, how does a team of distributed designers spread across different time zones, projects, competing objectives, ever find a way to work together so that they can create one coherent experience? And before he joined, uh, or when he joined, all of Spotify's applications, whether it was on desktop or mobile, had a very different look and feel and UI. And by implementing a design system, they were able to achieve cohesion across all of their products and also get all of their distributed designers working together in a more efficient way. Now, one of my favorite case studies for a design system is from the team at 18F. They worked on the US web design standards. And you know this is a huge undertaking that they had to take on. They, they started with the hypothesis that they could create a set of shared tools and that that could provide consistent, beautiful, and easy to use government websites. And they were up against a lot of inconsistency because there's thousands of people that are producing and maintaining government websites on a day-to-day -day basis. But it was really important to achieve this cohesion across US government sites. Um, designer Maya Bonari explains that when the American people go online to access government services, they're often met with confusing navigation systems, an array of visual brands, and inconsistent interaction patterns. And so creating consistency between these services is going to help people more effectively access the services that they need and in turn increase their trust in, in the government. And so here we're looking at um, a design system and the benefit that it has for our users, which is consistent user experiences, whereas the Spotify example we're looking at, um, you know, consistent user experiences but also team efficiency. But how do you define a design system? Maybe you could say that uh, a design system is a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. A method of designing products that's like building with Legos. And all of those can be true. 
So uh, Donella Meadows was an environmental scientist who wrote at length about systems. And I appreciate her definition of a system because I feel like it captures something that a lot of our definitions of design systems miss. And she says that a system is an interconnected set of elements coherently organized in a way that achieves something. So an interconnected set of elements coherently organized in a way that achieves something. So all of the elements of a system are united together by a shared purpose. And so her definition of a system consisted of these three parts. The elements, the interconnections between them, and their purpose. And so when all of these things exist, a good design system feels cohesive, unified, connected. Different teams know how to use them to create experiences. They inspire teams to use and contribute to them. And the systems grow bigger and stronger over time. But a bad design system might feel disjointed, confusing, difficult to use. It can feel like more of a hassle to get everyone using the design system instead of a time saver, instead of something that makes us more efficient. And ultimately, they just get abandoned or just not adopted at all. In my experience, building and watching others build design systems, I've seen them fail when there's too much focus on the elements and not enough focus on the way that these elements come together to solve a problem. So this might lead to a design system that might feel flexible, but it's actually difficult to use because there's not a clear sense about how all of these different patterns and components can be used together to solve problems. So what I've learned in my time creating design systems for clients and for my own internal teams is that in order to achieve all of those you know, good things that we want from design systems, we should start them not with components or modules or Legos, but with user scenarios. But of course, this wasn't always so obvious to me. So I'm the senior design director of product design at Vox Media which is a company that strives to build the future of journalism and entertainment. We have various editorial networks that explore topics that people care about, like news, tech, sports, and lifestyle, with brands like The Verge, Eater, and SB Nation. And three years ago, the Vox product team started a project to migrate all of our brands to one code base which meant that we also needed to create one flexible design system in order to support all of our brands. So we were looking at our eight brands, who in total have over 350 websites, all running on the same design system. Now, why were we doing this? This is, seems like a big undertaking. Um, the, the thing was that we had gotten to a point in, in time where it was just not maintainable for our product design and engineering teams to maintain the code bases of eight separate brands. And so what was happening was that we might be, let's say we launch a new feature for SB Nation. We couldn't leverage all of those good things uh, of that new feature and, and allow The Verge to use it. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was really move from supporting different websites to supporting a platform where we could create products that each of our brands could use and really launch new brands faster and evolve our own sites much more quickly. But we also wanted to help our editorial teams tell better stories faster. And so that was a main principle of our design system. But this was a hard problem to solve for. Each of our brand's websites were incredibly distinct and tailored to the individual brand need. They were full of custom components that ranged from brand to brand. 
The visual design system was also incredibly custom. So each brand had its own typography, color palette, and visual elements. But beyond all of that, our system needed to support different editorial missions, content types, and audience needs. And so while we had to unify all of these eight brand sites into one design and code system, we still needed to provide enough flexibility to allow our brands to still feel distinct. So when we kicked this off, um, we started with a couple questions. You know, what patterns or components do we need to build? How can these components be combined to create distinct experiences? How are we going to create a unique look and feel for over 300 websites using one visual design system? Uh, and so, you know, I think with, uh, with any big project, we started with some early assumptions that didn't exactly work. So, you know, we had a general idea that we would define smaller, modular components to define a page instead of defining uh, individual pages. And we also knew that we had to address inconsistencies in design, like different layouts, color, typography, different treatments of similar information. So we had a hypothesis that a flexible a set of brand agnostic modules with a theming system layered on top of it would give us the most range. Because again, we were really drawn to this idea of these Legos and these really reusable components that can you know, give us, unlock all of this different range. So you know, we started with these modular layouts and components. So here's three different homepage hero components that we designed, um, pretty general. So we had like a, a four up, a two up, a one up. Um, and some story blocks. So you can see, again, the variation between all of these story blocks is pretty presentational. So an image is bigger if the story is featured, or we add a little icon if there's a map. So essentially, we thought that we could create these really flexible modules and then layer color and typography over them with our theming system, and that that would be enough um, to make our brands feel unified yet distinct or cohesive. Um, but we quickly learned that that solution wasn't going to work. So for one, our sites felt too similar. But I think more importantly, we weren't accurately reflecting critical differences in content, tone, and audience. So take, for example, Curved and Recode. They're very different brands. They cover very different topic areas. Curbed covers homes and neighborhoods, while Recode covers tech and business. Curbed has, Curbed has a lot of service content, like maps and guides. They help you find um, places to live. While Recode has news, podcasts, and events. Um, but with our initial set of components for our design system, none of these critical differences are reflected here. And that's because the modules didn't have a clear purpose. The variations among them was primarily presentational. Which gets me back to the definition of a system that I was talking about in the beginning that says that a system is an interconnected set of elements coherently organized in a way that achieves something. Right? In a way that achieves something. So what, we were so wrapped up in the modularity of the system, but we weren't thinking about what our audience, audiences needed to accomplish when they came to our sites. So we had defined our elements, but not their interconnections or their purpose. So we actually found after this exercise that in order to create a flexible system, we needed to start by being specific. So here's what we learned. For one, you know, we couldn't start with individual components in isolation. And that's because successful design patterns don't exist in a vacuum. They don't ignore the context that they're in 
the people that are using them, the content that they need to display, and how they need to work with each other. So in her article for a list apart called The Language of Modular Design, Ala Kumutova writes that we should start with language and not interfaces when we're creating modular designs. What we found for our own system was that successful design systems start with content and with people. And for us, that meant considering our audiences, our editorial teams, the content that they produce and consume, as well as our revenue content and goals. So we had to ask more questions in order to better understand the needs of our design system. And all of these questions help to shape our system. Like, what are our audience goals? Is there a shared audience goal across all of our brands? Or are there differences? What's the editorial workflow? You know, some of our editorial teams have really large teams, while some have small ones. What range of content do we need to support? And that's not just range of content in terms of you know, what it is, like video versus audio versus text, but also a range of tones, like light versus you know, heavy and hard-hitting news. So this led to a much better process for us in developing this design system. Um, the key steps that we uncovered were start with a fast, unified platform, be scenario-driven when creating variations, and find key moments for visual brand expression that serve our audience. So the first step um, was creating this fast, unified baseline experience. So first and foremost, our platform should load quickly, be accessible, and work well across devices. And we should have a unified core user experience so that our audience can travel seamlessly across our brands. However, we shouldn't be creating one-size-fits-all solutions. We can have variations in components or layouts, even though we're working with a system, if those patterns are solving specific problems. And so scenarios and not layout should drive variation. And that means that we can't have hypothetical situations. Um, what I mean by that is we can't anticipate needs for our design system that don't exist. Because our audience aren't hypothetical people. They're coming to our sites to do specific things. And if we only focus our patterns on our patterns in the abstract, um, if we only reference other design systems while we're designing our own, then we might risk having um, the scenario that I talked about in the beginning, where we could have consistency across all of these different modules, but little, little coherence in the overall user experience. So, you know, I've said a couple times that this idea of scenarios helped my team kind of identify and hone the needs of our design system. But how do you do that? How do you get started? Um, Brad Frost, who's going to be speaking here, I think, tomorrow, um, popularized this UI inventory as a way to kick off a design system project. Um, and essentially, you do an audit of all of the UI elements across your site and then group them into categories like navigation, forms, tabs, and buttons. Um, and this allows you to see duplicative patterns and identify where you need to spend the most attention with your design system. In her book um, called Design Systems, Ala Komotova introduced the idea of a purpose-directed inventory. So while a visual inventory focuses on grouping things by appearance and type, like buttons and forms, this inventory groups items by their purpose. And she takes things a step further and recommends taking your core user journeys 
um, and mapping the core modules to sections of that user journey to help you see how these patterns fit into the bigger picture. <clears throat> what she said was that this exercise helped her team think about families of patterns joined by a shared purpose rather than individual pages or components. So let's break this down for a second. Families of patterns joined by a shared purpose. This is um, the website for the Free Library of Philadelphia that I'm just using as an example because a library is something that everyone understands. Um, you know, people come here when they want to find a nearby branch, search the catalog, reserve a book, take out a library card. And so if I was going to perform this purpose-directed inventory for this website, um, I can begin to group patterns based on the action that they enable. So essentially, I can go through, um, list out the most common pattern of uh, journeys that we want people to take, and then go through the site, take screenshots, and start grouping modules based on what, they're, what action they're helping someone do. So filtering items. You can just kind of capture all, everything related to filtering items. You can go more abstract. Viewing and learning about a book. And just kind of capture all of those different patterns in one place so you can look at them all together. What you start to notice when you do this is the difference between a presentational difference and a semantic difference. So in other words, there might be two patterns that look different that are actually solving the same problem. Or you might have patterns that look similar that are solving different problems. So, let me take one of those examples. I can take all of the patterns that are associated with viewing and learning about a book, and I can start to map their content. And I can see that they all share a thumbnail and a title, which is important information because you're learning about books. Some of them have an author name, a published date. If you're accessing this card through the catalog, you can see whether it's available at your branch. And so from here, I can take all of that content and begin to, to create or sketch out a new unified component. So let's say I can sketch out a new component called the book card that contains all of the required information for that book card. And then you know, I know that in some cases, you might want to see the, the availability of it at your branch. So there can be a variation um, on this component, which has the availability. And so essentially, I can go from having many patterns that are serving the, ser the same purpose. Um, and it, you can see there, like all of the type related to these patterns was different, the colors, the layout of them. Um, but by doing this exercise, I can start to consolidate my similar patterns um, and go from many to having one pattern with a variable state. So, you know, ultimately, this purpose-directed inventory should help us to identify the core workflows and the patterns that need to support these workflows, understand the role that each pattern plays in a user's journey, and then define how all of these patterns work together to create a cohesive experience. Scenarios can also help to add focus to many kind of levels of your design system. Um, I love seeing this page in the Salesforce Lightning Design Systems layout page where they say, know your use case. Before you start doing anything, know your use case and understand how the information on the page will be used. So they have different examples of different layout templates and when to use them. So just pulling a couple of them. 
uh, workspace, facilitates user collaboration on records. Board is used for items that are advancing through a linear workflow. Reference for when users are primarily jumping to related records. I think what's really great about documentation like this and about um, writing documentation for aspects of your design system that are based in user scenarios is that one of the most common problems or challenges that I hear about design systems is adoption. I'm creating this design system. How do I get designers and engineers to start using the system that I've created? And I think that by writing the documentation in terms of scenarios, you know, a designer or a UX designer is automatically already thinking in terms of scenarios. And if they can go to a page like this and they know that, oh, I'm creating something where someone is going to need to advance through a linear workflow, I'm going to use this pattern. And it just makes the whole um, process of using your design system and getting adoption just work much better. Um, I think Shopify's Polaris design system is another great example of a design system that puts users at the forefront. And they also use scenarios to define their patterns, which I love. So this is one of their principles for their design system, where they say, put merchants first. Think about their needs and think about how you can map your process to how real merchants think and work. And you can see that all of the documentation is written with that in mind. So this pattern is called the callout card. And they say that callout cards are used to encourage merchants to take an action related to a new feature or opportunity. So again, you know, they're writing this documentation in a way that's really focused on what action are we driving from uh, and helping users do. Scenarios can also be used to guide visual design in design systems. I've already talked about the US web design standards in the beginning, but something that I think they do really well is on their typography page, they don't just list out, you know, here's the primary font, here's the secondary font, here's our, our type scale. They actually provide more documentation and education about when to use what type pairing. So for instance, they have their default um, type pairing, which they recommend for using when you have um, services that feature forms um, and more basic um, websites. But they also have a um, type system that they call robust, which has an additional font. And they recommend for more text heavy or visual promotional sites. And again, you know, with their design system, they're trying to get thousands of government employees to adopt it. And by doing that extra level with the documentation and providing a recommendation that's based around you know, what purpose are you trying to achieve, they can encourage much more adoption of this system. So here's some examples about how this scenario-driven process played out for our design system at Vox. Um, and I'll go through three different examples that were slightly different um, for our features, our home pages, and our reviews. So features are pieces of long-form content that typically cover a topic with great depth. They contain beautiful illustrations, original photography, and engaging interactives. These would be the, what Jeffrey called the more uh, slow experiences, the ones that you want people to spend a lot of time on. Um, and previously, um, before we moved to our design system, our features were all very custom built, and they were also really challenging for our editorial teams to update. So essentially, we had to take 18 distinct templates that had 81 different code snippets uh, and turn that into one flexible design system. 
So the way that we started this was by identifying the core workflows and the content that goes into these features. Um, the core workflows in this case is the workflow of someone visiting our features and the steps that they take, but also the workflow of our ed editorial teams and the steps that they take to produce a feature. Um, what we found in this case was that the audience goals were pretty consistent across the board for all of our brands for a piece of long form content. Um, but there was a lot of variation within the content that goes into a feature that we needed to support. So, you know, the user flow for a feature typically starts with a user entering the page through search or social media. We want to catch their attention, keep them engaged with the content, and then if they make it all the way to the bottom, guide them towards related or relevant content. So the basic components uh, of the features were a lead image, a text box, and a recirculation module. Where we built in variation to our feature was in order to support the various ranges of content that we needed to, to support. So you know, previously, we had um, 81 individual snippets. Um, a snippet is something that an editorial um, person adds to their feature. So it could be a table, a sidebar, um, a photo gallery, anything that they can drop in to make it more robust. Um, so we had 81 of those, many of which didn't work or had duplicative functionality across all of our brands. Um, and then the other big thing that we were up against was dealing with all of the variation within our lead image, um, lead images. So in order to support these variations in um, photography and illustration for the, for the lead image, um, we created different variations for the lead image component. So we have um, head below, which highlights photography, puts it front and center. Head above, which still displays photography prominently, but it prioritizes the text. Head overlay, which is for when um, images might be low quality or textural, and you kind of screen it back and use it in the background, and it's more of a um, adding texture, but the main piece of content isn't going to be a photograph like it is here. Head below short image. You know, a lot of our editorial teams commission illustrations, and some of those illustrations um, might work better really um, widescreen or very tall, um, and we'll have different kind of uh, lead image variations for that. And then uh, side by side, which is um, so specifically for vertical images, uh, like this delicious hamburger um, right before lunchtime. Um, but the key here um, was that we only added a layout variation if there was a content need. We weren't adding variations up front for the sake of it. Um, in fact, the side-by-side -side variation was added much later um, when we got a lot of editorial requests for supporting vertical images. So now to our snippets. Like I said, these are different components that editors can drop into their features, like a pull quote, horizontal rule, gallery sidebar. Um, and we had a bunch of them. So what we did was we completed a content audit to understand which of those needed to be included in our design system. And so you know, we took all of them, the entire list, and we asked, does this component add value? Is it currently available to more than three brands? Or is it a must-have for one brand? Is it so core to their brand mission that they will fail if they don't have this one component? Um, and so after performing that audit, we were able to reduce the number of snippets from 81 to 43, kind of cut that number in half. So you know, I, 
I've mentioned a couple of times that one of the important things with this design system was making sure that we could express brand in a compelling way. Um, for, for the features, we did that in a couple of ways. The lead image component is a really kind of big one, um, and making sure that that was well supported was, was important. Um, but we also looked at different ways that a, a drop cap or a pull quote could help elevate the art direction of a story. So we started with our 18 very different feature templates that were you know, hard to maintain and, and difficult for our editorial teams to create without needing an engineer, um, and then moved to one robust system that could support different content scenarios across device widths, um, but still feel distinct to each of our individual brands. So on to reviews. Uh, this process went a little bit differently. A review is essentially a feature, but it has an additional component called a scorecard. And when we started, um, three of our brands had a, a reviews program, Eater, The Verge, and Polygon. Uh, and they each used very different looking scorecards that were, you know, different content, different hierarchy, different visual design. And so initially, we started with one component, um, which was one scorecard component, very flexible, had three sections where you could look at the meta info, uh, have calls to action, and then there was an open text field where our editorial teams could add whatever content they wanted in there and format it using our, our formatting tools. The problem was that these scorecards were for vastly different things. Food and restaurants, games and products. And so the people looking at these scorecards had different goals. You know, if they're going to eat or they want to know where to eat and what to order. If they're on Polygon, they want to know what game to buy. And if they're on The Verge, they want to know what, what product, what gadget, what iPhone should I buy. And so that also meant that the content displayed in each of these scorecards was very different. So for a restaurant, I want to know the address, I want to know how much it costs, I want to know how to book a table. For a game, I want to know what platforms it's on, who's the publisher, when's it's what's the release date. Versus for a phone, I might want to know what's the pro-con list compared to the, with this one compared to another phone, how can I buy this? And so instead of just having one scorecard component, what we did in this case was we had three different variations on the scorecard component. A venue card, a product card, and a game card. And so each of them highlights the most appropriate content for the purpose that someone is, is using this for. So the venue card highlights all the content that helps you find where to eat. So you see the address, the website, the phone number for the restaurant there. The game card, you can see um, all of the scores across all of the platforms that this game is on, which is very specific to video games and not something that's going to be relevant to um, a product or a restaurant. Um, and then the product card, um, this was actually like our, our kind of base, base component. Um, and it has the most kind of generic mix of information, like an image and uh, open text field and buy now buttons. So we started with three completely different scorecard modules, and then we went to our first unified version, which was one scorecard, where the content basically had the same hierarchy across the board, and it wasn't specific enough. Um, and then after, where we have three separate scorecard variants, the venue, game, and product, and each one is tailored to showcase the most valuable content for that subject matter. Uh, but these are still flexible components. So, you know, Eater, if Eater decides to start reviewing games or products, um, it'll be available to them to start using. Uh, 
Um, and then because of our theming system, um, if SB Nation or Curbed um, suddenly want to start a reviews program, the components are already built out with their branding. And so there's no additional product work or engineering work to get that up and running. Um, our home pages were the most challenging of all to unify. Um, one reason being that home pages are political and emotional, but also they were incredibly robust and distinct to each of our brands. And so what we had to do here was um, identify the core workflows again and discover the patterns that we needed on our home page. So we started this with a research phase to define, like, all right, we're not going to create all of the components across all of our home pages and build that into the system, which are the most critical ones. So we asked ourselves, what is the value of our home pages today? Who is our home page audience? What are they looking for? Um, how are they currently performing? Um, and so we kind of sent out this audience survey and discovered that our homepage audience tends to be a more loyal repeat user rather than someone that's coming in, um, uh, rather than a lot of new users. Um, so we narrowed that down to kind of three main workflows. So the homepage should help you know what's new, what's important, and what's helpful. Um, and from there, we broke that down into these three primary areas of purpose. And um, then we broke that down into, OK, what patterns do we need to create to support those goals? So I'll take one of them, for example, um, the story feed. The story feed is higher, has a higher content density because the homepage audience tends to be a repeat user, so they kind of want to read a lot of things and, and, and see it at a glance. They prefer RevCron, um, and so this helps them kind of like see things faster. Um, and then that kind of pattern is made up of these different smaller components called entry boxes. And so the entry box has different kind of presentational variations based on the content that's in, inside there. So a, a review could display the score, while a map could have a, a little map icon so you know what that content is. Um, and this then gets us to the variations that we supported for the home page. Back in the beginning of the talk, um, we talked about how we initially started by creating these really generic home page heroes because we thought that they'd be the most flexible and that, that in fact, did not work out. So our revised homepage heroes all serve specific content-driven goals, and they have specific names. So newspaper is a text-heavy layout for busy news reporting. Evergreen um, highlights both recent and evergreen content. Morning recap, um, a hero for the morning after a busy night of sporting events. Um, and you'll notice here that each of these components has a specific name rather than in the beginning where we had more generic kind of one-up, two-up, three-up names. Um, I really love this quote from the language of modular design that says, in the process of naming an element, you work out the function as a group and reach an agreement. And this gets me to, I think, one of the greatest lessons learned from working on design systems, which is that you need to name components collaboratively. You can't have either designers naming all of the components or engineers doing all of the naming on their own, um, because establishing clear, shared language is going to help us make better decisions about the purpose of each of our components and how they should be used. But it also helps collaboration go more smoothly and makes the design and development process faster. So, you know, I talked about in the beginning, one of the benefits of design systems is increased velocity, and establishing the shared common language is an important step to get there. So that's been one of the biggest lessons learned um, for me and my team. So, Again, building brand expression into our design system was another big goal for us. There's a lot of talk of 
you know, design systems stifling creativity or leading to rigid, one-size-fits-all solutions, which was definitely the fear that we had at Vox Media when we moved to one design system. And I won't lie, it is more challenging to power vastly different brands with one design system than when we could have a separate code base for The Verge versus Vox. But there are ways to achieve flexibility within a design system. Um, again, Brad Frost has a blog post called Pattern Variations, where he talks about the different levers that you can pull to add flexibility in a design system. Content, structure, style, and behavior. Um, I'll start with content, right? If we look at BBC Gel's card component, this is a pattern that lets you preview and share content quickly. And it has different presentational variations based on the content that it's displaying. So whether it's text or video or audio, there's slight visual cues that helps the user know that this is a different piece of content. Structural, structural variations are things like um, including icons in this call to action bar um, and displaying them with labels or without. For style variations, I think Google mat Google's material design theming system is a really inspiring inspiration of how much flexibility you can build into a design system just by changing color, type, and shape. Um, and then variations in behavior. So again, the BBC card has an optional expand or collapse functionality. And that helps you kind of vary a component based on the different purpose that it might need to serve. Um, so going back to our design system to show how some of these variations can come together to achieve different tones, um, these two packages from Curbed and Eater are using the exact same components, but the content is different. You know, one, is, one of them is using illustration, while the other one is using photography. And then the visual styles via our theming system are different, so they also convey a different tone uh, with the color palettes. And so in some cases, for our design system, we have really flexible components, like this promo bar, um, which again, you can, um, we have different flexibility in the content and styling. And in other cases, we added components to our design system specifically to support more impactful brand expression. So this masthead component was created for The Verge. Um, they, they can curate the image that goes behind there themselves and also change the tagline that is um, in the masthead. And the most exciting part about that is that the Verge can use the masthead and a kind of one-up hero when they drop a really big story and use these two really flexible components to essentially art direct their page. And I think it's pretty, pretty great to see how just these two components can completely um, dramatically change the tone of their page and they don't need any engineering support to achieve this. And so you can see here that with a couple of variations, Vox and The Verge can feel very different. So The Verge has the masthead on, while Vox has the standard navigation. Vox has the newspaper hero, while The Verge has the masonry hero. And then with our theming system that allows um, color and type options, immediately you get a sense that the content is different. but they're all built on the same unified platform, which helps our teams with scale and sustainability. So the last piece of this was our visual design system. When we, when we started out, we knew that we needed to create a platform where brands could feel distinct. We needed to express strong editorial voice and identity. Um, 
and that we also needed to kind of support brand expression that was um, really related to the content and the, and the tone and the voice of each of our brands. So we broke that down by having uh, foundational elements, but also finding areas where we could customize. So our foundational elements are um, our type scale, our color system, our spacing variables. Um, so with our type scale, uh, all of our brands have different typefaces, which vary in height and width and weight, so we couldn't have just fixed sizes for um, each of them in the system. So instead, we have um, a type scale in our design system that can be used to kind of, kind of fine tune for each individual brand. Similarly, um, all of our brands have distinct color palettes. So we needed to not only determine the color palette for all of our brands, but also figure out how we could use color variables to map each element of our sites to a color. So for example, here I can swap out the link color on the verge, and it'll cascade um, across the, the front end. And the color variables can actually be pretty powerful. So here are three polygon subbrands that are identical, um, except for different logos and different values set for the gradient color, the nav background, and the link color. And so um, our theming system has a baseline theme, and then each brand has its own kind of values that hook into the baseline theme, and that's how they can um, have distinct brand expression within the system. Now, something that we struggled with a lot was what kind of variation is good in a design system and what kind of variation is bad. From my perspective, um, variation is good if there's a specific problem that we need a new pattern to solve, if it's determined by user scenarios and content needs, and or if it strengthens brand voice in a way that serves our audience. So when is that variation bad? When it's visual variation on components that serve the same function across the board, um, or if it doesn't do much to strengthen brand voice. So an example of what I would consider bad variation that we had, um, these are some news newsletter modules, and they're completely consistent in functionality and layout, right? You can put in your email address, you can submit, you can see the privacy statement, that's about it. Um, but we did have a ton of different visual variation built into this one little component. So what we ended up doing was kind of pulling that back and making our newsletters have a more consistent visual, visual style. Um, and again, the reason why we did this is because they're so small. <laughs> it's not the place for us to add a bunch of, of um, you know, customization and, and bloat to our code. Something like the masthead, um, which The Verge uses, and it's really powerful and impactful. I think that's a great place for variation. But this little newsletter, we just need it to simplify. And so, you know, the combination of our scenario-driven variations with this theming system allowed us to create brands that felt distinct but still unified. Um, and so before, um, our teams were spending lots of time building custom one-off solutions. And a perfect example of this is what our editorial teams call packages. Packages are collections of related stories like travel guides, shopping guides, and game guides. And previously, our reporters and developers spent a lot of time building and customizing these stories. 
What we did last year was build a new storytelling format for packages, again, using reusable components, some, some components that we were already using for our home pages and features, as well as some new components like a table of contents that helps you navigate around a package. Um, but again, because we have this theming system, we can achieve a lot of variability in the look and feel for each of the packages. Um, I think the most exciting thing about this is that, you know, before the um, editorial teams needed an engineer to build these out custom for them, and now they can kind of drop in the stories that they want to link together in a package and kind of customize the layout themselves using some of the, the variation that we built into the system. Which gets us to kind of the goal that we really wanted from this thing, which was to help our reporters tell better stories faster. If our reporters don't need to worry about building complex layouts, they can really focus on the content, and they can focus on getting out the best possible content to our audiences. Um, and I think that was the other big lesson learned about a system, is that the, let the system take on the hard work for you, the repetitive, complex problems, so that your teams can focus on new experiences, building new things, um, experimenting, solving the, the more complex, interesting problems to you. And let the system do the work so that people can focus on doing the best things possible. Um, you know, what's next for this? Um, there's some, still some parts of this that we need to figure out. Um, I think we, we have everyone on this unified system, but we still need work to do on um, really refining what brand expression means um, in, a, in a just stronger way. Uh, you know, we got to the first step, but how can we take it further? How can we do even better with supporting the variability in type metrics? So still work to come um, on that front. Um, but again, to wrap this up, successful design patterns don't exist in a vacuum, right? They don't ignore the context that they're in, the people that are using them, and the content that they need to display, and how they all work together to create these really clear user experiences. Because successful design systems solve specific problems, right? We're not dealing with hypothetical problems, we don't want to kind of add a lot of cruft to our design systems. We want to be really purposeful. And uh, the way we do that is by starting with content and with people. All right. Thank you. If you all have questions, feel free to find me at lunch. <laughs>